We we'll begin with the greats, the great modernists. Le Cabusier in the Villa Sign. We know simply that this, um, I haven't got a pointer. We know simply that on the street side there are narrow windows and broad bands of um, solid. Each time I look at a project and I'll see a few things of compositional interest. With Corbusier's Villa Stein, um, what is interesting is how the facade is composed. The, it consists, the composition of the facade consists of the shape of the facade itself, the horizontal bands, and the um, projecting balcony in the center at the top. And then the, the ground floor is allowed to do a lot more variable things. Um, on the reverse side, um, the solid and um, fenestration are reversed. Um, so what is happening here is that Corbusier is using a, a rather strict um, compositional idea. And if you look on the reverse, the bottom, the um, ground floor of the building is turned into pilates so there's a sort of comparison between the two and in the villa la roche what i want to show with this um image is um the way that uh, corbusier is able to compose fenestration and that's a difficult thing currently when we look at verdicts we see a lot of very large areas of glass and corbusier was extremely clever at making um Fenestration would actually work. The windows opened at the height that they wanted. There was a sense of enclosure through the horizontal. Um, and that's probably most adequately shown in the Maison Clarté in Geneva. But we'll start from the view that we have here. So on the one side, there's a travertine wall with um, beautifully arranged openings, a small window above um, a panel of um, glass bricks, because that's in a a duplex, the end duplexes, and then the other apartments, the duplexes of a different type. And if you look at the facade here, um, I've been in here, my experience of this building is that, that there is a different type of glass in each panel. So below waist height, it's hammered glass and obscured. And then there's a clear glass in the middle, at, at high height, a body height, which opens and then higher up, um, glazing, which is just for uh, lighting. <clears throat> and this is a project which, um, it, this isn't communicable by images, but <clears throat> when you stand in this building, there's a tremendous sense of um, collectivity in this building, of the way that a group of people look out high up over Geneva. And it's a building which has able, been able to accept wear. And in the base, the, the travertine is, and gives a solidity to the base. And the detailing is rather beautiful. And you find this in Corbusier a lot, that solid is shown on one facade. And then, for example, on the Pavilion Suisse, it's reduced to a band, to infill. So there are, I would say, visual and rhetorical gestures here. If we look at, um, Alto's Enzo Good, Enzo Good Side building in 1962 in Helsinki. I think what we see is um, a great modernist able to deal with um, the past. One of the factors of modernism was in some hands, like Handel Smyer, there was an absolute repudiation of what had gone before and a desire to make an abstract architecture for the, the times of, of modernism's occurrence. But with Alto, he was always able to make this building look at the city behind it. And um, so there's an analogy between um, the um, marble facade here and the white painted city that's just a bit further along on the quay. And what is very interesting about this facade is that Alto recognizes that the facade in an office building will inevitably, in a modern office building, will inevitably be, be repetitious so that it can be subdivided and re-subdivided. And that the windows in it need to be of manageable size um, so they don't need to drop below um, windowsill level. 
And the out outcome of that would have been, without any elaboration, would have been a series of holes in a flat wall. And so Alto's work here is to elaborate this facade through making the sill dip down, through splaying the reveals, through making a panel in the window that opens the small panel on to the side. And it has a base, but all buildings throughout history have almost exactly the same issues of um, basements which disappear as the ground rises. And Alto somehow absorbs that and turns it into something special because this, at street level, this is what you see. And the building frames the water, but it also reflects the sky. Um, and the, the um, verticals turn into columns with a, um, a copper base. And then on the reverse side, which faces the church, to get the depth of space um, so that daylighting works, there's a big inset. But something else is happening here. There's a, a sense of um, the power of ruined buildings here. So Alto, among the modernists, was the one with, I would say, the most romantic sense. And um, that actually is an aspect of Colin St. John Wilson's writing about what he called the other modernism. Now, Mies van der Rohe is my um, uh, next on my list. Mies, um, as we know, went to America. And I think in America, he, well, first of all, he, um, when he was younger, he said that everything that a young architect needed to know could be found in Schinkel's Altus Museum. Um, but when he went to America, you know, he'd made a number of pavilions uh, like the, the um, Tugendhat house. But when he went to America, where there was a completely different building typology, he did something miraculous. This is my feeling for it, that he understood that the steel eye section was intrinsically American. And he understood that the facade would be repetitious. And somehow he was able to present the eye section, and this is a bronze eye section, I know, but he was able to present the eye section as if it were as significant as a Greek column. So this building, as always with me, is, has a lot of experiential qualities. So we all know that it's set back from Park Avenue, which is not what developers, architects would do. But Mies created a, a pavilion, a, a plaza. But that plaza has a very distinct quality because on each side, the street on each side of the plaza folds away so that when you are sitting in it, there's no peripheral traffic. So it's very peaceful. It's uncannily peaceful as a place in a big city. And for some reason, and I can't explain why, this green stone edge <clears throat> participates in that sense of calm. And we can see here from the side street that people sit on it and they're oblivious to the traffic. I mean, of course they can sense it, but something in that space gives them the peace of mind to spend time in the city. And another thing that's always pleased me very much is that, as you can see that the lift shafts the fenestration of the lift shaft, the glass and the curtain walling, the lift shaft has been replaced with stone. So it's, Mies was never uh, the purist that one may take him to be from his words. He was always, let's say in the end, desirous of producing an image rather than the factual reality. And where the building um, changes shape to make um, the Four Seasons restaurant, it looked uncannily like the form of the building next to it. And that doesn't stop there because this photograph by Irvin Seltzer, I think, um, shows that consciously or not, the, this new building, which represented, I would say, a new age, looks back to a building probably not older than 30 years, um, 
of it uh, and looks at it with um, mutual pleasure. So both buildings form the city, both buildings are part of the city. And there's an interesting statement by uh, Jean Nouvel, which is that he says that all cities are a series of modernities. Now, something interesting, just further up along Park Avenue is Skidmore Owens and Merrill's Pepsi Cola building, which is a sort of vernacular version of Mies. And we, I'm sure you all know that, that this formation that Mies made of verticals and horizontals became a, a sort of methodology for or means of producing commercial facades across the world, but principally in America. But this is different. What I want to say here is that even in such a reduced palette as Mies is building, different things can be said. So this is much more relaxed. The Mies facade is um, commanding and it allows the density of the fins and the fact that the glass is um, bronze allows it to be seen as a monolith, whereas the Pepsi Cola building projects the life of people in the office into the street. So this is another aspect of facades that with very small changes of intent, different things can be said. Now I, I want to reintroduce the, or introduce the constructivists because it seems to me that, well certainly my students have never heard of these people and they were the parallel movement in Russia to modernism. And modernism, let's say architectural history has largely been written by Western um, commentators. And it's only recently that work from other parts of Europe from the former Soviet bloc is being given credit. And the constructive of works were very significant for people like Stalin and Gaon, for example. And later on in this presentation, I'll show some work from the Soviet period to show that too is worth studying. But as I understand it from my friend, Alexei Ginsberg, who's the <clears throat> grandson of Moshe Ginsberg, the constructive ar architect. These buildings were carefully um, uh, proportioned, often with the golden section, but they're also doing something else. If we look at uh, Melnikov's Rusikov Workers' Club, it's an absolutely straightforward statement of function. And this was a short-lived period in Soviet architecture which wanted to convey the possibilities of the revolution. And I haven't slides to illustrate the point I'm gonna make, but very quickly um, under the new regime, there was a desire for a socialist realist architecture, which has always been considered by Western um, commentators as being inferior. But if you look at it, as I did when I was in Moscow, first of all, it's beautifully sited. Secondly, it's beautifully made. Thirdly, it's very beautifully um, um, composed. But the real mystery is Melnikov's own house in Moscow. And it's really unclear to anybody how he managed to make this house in the middle of the Soviet regime. And it's as far away as constructivism as you can get because it's actually a sort of mystic, has a mystical content in the bedrooms. Everybody sleeps in the same room. All the furnishings are very old fashioned. But it's barely, well, it's not modernist, it's a real sport. But I show it because it's so compelling to me, or to, at least to my generation. And that double facade, which is for the studio, is entirely made of wood because we have to understand that constructivists didn't have modern materials. They built a lot of what they uh, wanted to make out of um, wood and bricks. So for example, these windows here on the back are this shape partly because they could be made without lintels. So the brickwork is corbelled and then it's plastered. But it produces a really interesting fenestration. I always wondered how those windows worked. And the fact is they just drop in and are taken out in summer. So in summer, it can be like a sort of dovecot with air flowing through it. So it's very beautiful. And the studio is exceptionally interesting. But I always thought this space would be 
wonderful for painting because the light would be so diffused, but it's kind of strangely dark. <clears throat> the modernists, um, I have um, would describe as those second generation modernists who um, came, let's say, from um, post Second World War. And I'll begin with seeing the <coughs> I think is a great, a great hero of mine. Um, and this is a photograph of her underneath the Museum of Art Sao Paulo under construction, looking at the way that a painting could be displayed. And of course, that's not a real Van Gogh, but I'll show you how they were displayed. They were displayed on sheets of glass in a concrete block. And this is Lena's drawing of the space behind behind the um, museum. The museum, as you can see, spans long rise and in a kind of an appropriate way. <clears throat> and it, partly that's because there's a roadway that runs deep underneath it. But I suspect it could have been done in a different way. I suspect this span is completely about a social gesture. And one thing that is really interesting in this project is that it's an art gallery with glass on both sides. Goodness knows how they kept the paintings safe. And the collection is wonderful. I mean, a really significant collection that I think mostly was brought over by Nina Barbadi's husband, who was an art collector. But the objective here was that all of the paintings could be seen together against each other and in the context of the city. So a very, very romantic gesture. And as a building, it, it, if when I first saw it in um, in photographs, I thought it was um, crude, and I didn't know why people liked it. And you have to visit this building to understand its greatness. And Lena Bobardi has this tremendous visual acuity. So in this building and in the um, Sesca Pompeii, the cultural center, also in um, Sao Paulo you can see that, that she really knows how something will look in, in contrast to something else. So this building, because it sits over a hill, there'll never be anything built behind it. So there's daylight underneath the building. And on the reverse way, you look back on into a park. And this space underneath would seem to be unusable. But in fact, according to people I know from Brazil, it is used, it does actually work. It's, it does fulfill what Lena thought it would be. And I'll show you some of Lena's furniture. I've got slightly the wrong presentation here, which I um, regret having spent all afternoon making another one, but I'll do this. What we'll do is we'll walk around the building to see how a building which begins with a very, very simple gesture, which is a box on legs with a platch underneath it has um, vitality, <clears throat> it has that vitality because the architect understands that detail is a way of crystallizing the ideas in the large ideas in the project. So as you walk around the building, there's a discovery of its shape, a discovery of this um, element at the back and separate entrance. And then you walk around further and the road turns up again. So she'd understood the drama of this space. And she also understood how on the right hand side, that wall with little stones in it would look and be very poignant in relation to the concrete in comparison to the concrete on the left hand side. And this is a building which was made before the white buildings you see in, in the image were constructed. So I imagine that before they, when the Lena building was made, it, there was empty space. But what I want to say about this is that the building of social strength and architectural strength can hold off the kind of mediocre de development that we see in the surroundings. Peter Selsing, in a similar way, but in a much more refined way, produces the culture house in um, um, in um, Stockholm in 1972. 
And yes, it's a giant gesture, but it's a really different sensibility. If you go there, it's intrinsically Swedish from that period. It was a place which wasn't an art gallery. It was a place where um, handicrafts happened, communal activities happened. And interestingly, the advisor to Selsing on this building was um, Eustace, to, not Eustace to him, he was the um, man whose name I've forgotten, who direct, who he became the first director of the Pompidou Center. So there was a huge social idea here of um, culture and arts being a social um, good. And we look at this facade and we think it's very simple, but if you look at it in profile, there's all sorts of setbacks which animate it. And this is a particularly interesting photograph for me. It's from a bridge and it shows me that some very large buildings we know destroy cities around them by their ignorance. But some very large buildings, which are full of good spirit and good architecture, can actually enhance and work with their surroundings. Now, Asnaga and Vendere are a completely different type of architect. And the reason for showing this is that the facade is completely fascinating. Um, and it, you might say uses the um, white architecture and fenestration of um, Corbusier, but in a completely different way. So if you look, the, the fenestration changes shape according to what goes on behind it. Now to do this and to draw it all together into a, a successful composition requires real talent. And um, yeah, I've got completely the wrong, wrong presentation here, so you bear with me, but I'll um, speed through this. What, what we see here is that things like the um, windows turning around the corner and turning into the roof, which is very adventurous. And the roof um, uh, opening up for, um, well, here we see it. But these, this part interests me. These are obviously the bathrooms because you look at the reeded glass and they're usually the least considered element of a facade, but here they're drawn into a composition. They actually divide the facade into two through a, an act of weakness, which is very a very interesting way of being. And the fence around it even is interesting. So you have a garage gate and then a solid wall next to it. And then there's the entrance itself. And then you walk down here to the entrance to the building, which is in the middle of the building. And at that moment in that corridor, you see a really lovely combination of windows, a window with the balcony, the one with the shutter on it, and then below a, um, a window to the basement. And then you come upon a, a piece of glazing which reveals the side of the stair um, in a modernist way, but very, let's say in a very cultivated way. Um, and then there's the entrance and then the stairs inside for some strange reason. And then we'll go into the back garden. And I, yeah, I've got too many slides here. I went through them. What you find at the back is that the facade is very regular at the reverse side, surprisingly so. And it has all these incidents. I think what's happening here with Asnago and Vendere is that they make a, a formal proposition, a very loose formal proposition. And then they allow contingencies to happen or they allow contingencies to be expressed architecturally. Yep, completely the wrong presentation, forgive me. But and then in the, um, there's a bunch of, bar a group of balconies which look sideways, obviously because of some overlooking issue or catching the sun. So it's a really strong piece of um, successful composition which um, doesn't suppress difference and contingency, but actually incorporates it and lets it revitalize the facade. And that stare that one sees 
coming in, you see again, if you're going out from the lobby and then you go to the street. Um, unique talents. Well, Alvaro Cesar, we know is a very unique talent and I'll discuss one of his early buildings, which I think is one of his best. And it's the um, Carlos Ramos Pavilion in the Porto School of Architecture from 1986. And it's set in the garden of an existing house, which you see here. And that house, the position of that house in the garden um, is a way, is a, something that Caesar uses to um, make the whole of the project. So what we start with, <coughs> looking back from the pavilion, you look back to the house and when you come in, you see the house on its corner. And this gives the visual cue for the whole of the project. So you walk around it and the corner's cut away. And then you find a window. And then that cutaway embraces, just by chance, I'm sure, a building which Caesar converted into a studio. So each, it's a series of experiential, a series of experiences shaped by the building and experiences that in a way you yourself can determine. So at the back there's a view through into a courtyard in the center which is that shape which I'll show you in a second. And the studios on the first floor are really I think most wonderful spaces because they look across this courtyard to each other so each studio has some privacy and sense of um, identity, but they also have companionship through um, being able to see each other across the courtyard. And that courtyard does something strange. It doesn't embrace the view, it compresses it. And why that is, it's a little hard to explain, but actually when you're in there, it, I think it's about the concentration of those studios. And then at a certain point, there's a giant window in one of the studios which looks out right across the Duro Valley to one of the bridges. So architectural students in first year know what they're going to be building in the future of their life. Khan is, let's say, an enigma, but a great enigma because he came from modernism and he embraced an idea of the past, I think. It's a, a fiction. His idea of the past is of some place before classicism, which still exists and which can inform architecture of the present time. And I think this came from Kahn's travels where he drew and looked. And it's interesting because he was a modernist, but his work produced uh, let's say his teaching produced people like Venturi, who understood his work and its reference to history in a way that I thought was, I still think was very unproductive. But Kahn always, let's say, was able to manage abstraction and a sense of the present. So here we see Kahn's making an analogy between concrete and stone. You know, the modern material, modernist material par excellence is said to be equal to stone, the um, ancient construction material par excellence. And one enters, and as you saw from the first aerial photograph, it's a series of vaults. And one thing that I find inexplicable about Khan is his, his um, desire to impose geometries on things, which is very strange. It doesn't, sometimes in Khan, things don't make sense. You know, they, they, experientially they make sense, but as an argument or as a way of doing things, you wonder. But here in the Texas heat, you walk under shade and on the other side, you walk up past the car park. And Khan was always at pains to um, embrace the car as a new element in the city. And you arrive under this shade and then inside the, the um, galleries are the same shape and they have a slot in the ceiling which 
does do what this photograph suggests. It does reflect sunlight back onto the roof in a way that is very, very beautiful. This photograph doesn't get it accurately because it can't, but the light is really exceptional. And um, there's a funny story. He's, Khan's engineer, Oscar Commandant, said Khan didn't know anything about structure. Khan spoke endlessly about structure and the way that Mies van der Rohe spoke endlessly about construction, but they didn't really mean <coughs> buildable construction. And Commandant said, um, Khan, des Khan describes these always as vaults, but they can't be vaults because he cut the middle out of them. So in fact, they're very, very long beams. And what's really striking about this building is that, that unlike contemporary gallery spaces, such as I might design, they're very figured. They have beautiful materials in them and changes the material in the floor. Um, a paneling system, which you can see, which hooks into the Sophie. And Khan understood the collection. The collection is very rich, um, you know, it has, work like this. And so he understood that a building which in a very measured way was also rich would be the right answer. And then inside the art, the, um, there are internal courts with sunshades over them and a rather splendid um, basement for uh, restoration. And then the library, which is forced up into the arch and the lights are very low and then it looks out perversely onto the back of a, another one of the infield arches. And then the lecture theatre, which is the wrong shape because it's too long and too narrow. But this is the one thing I like so much, the handrail made of rolled stainless steel with the end open so that most detailed material like handrails are forgotten and this doesn't let you forget its materiality and this will go back to something I said earlier which is that design if it's to be any good has to continue right the way into detail nothing should escape the eye of a designer if you want a good building individualists now these are architects who I claim have less explicit social awareness. And I, I think with um, Khan and Caesar, you could see a desire to make a place for the public at the same time as making the architecture that they feel they have to. With Leverance and the people that will follow, it's architecture as an art form. And yes, it's communicative. When you go to St. Mark's Church in Stockholm, it's very moving, but it's, it's um, driven by ideas that even Ledbrands didn't really explain, couldn't explain. For example, the desire to um, not cut any brick. You probably all know this, but in this building and the next one that I'll show, Ledbrands made a rule that no bricks could be cut. And it means that the, that the bonding is different, you know, the pair pens don't line up. So it's much more like knitting in a curious kind of way. And in a curious kind of way, it's also similar, although it's not the same, it's metaphorically similar to the, the silver birch trees you see in front of it. And here's what it looks like. And the interior is genuinely mysterious. Uh, he is, as I understand it, Leverens was not an observant Christian, but he understood the, the theatre that's necessary to help other people with their beliefs. And having made one religious building, that's a very interesting experience because you have to do it without cynicism or gesture. You have to empathise into people when they're at their most defenceless, when they are appealing to something outside themselves. And Leverens understood that. So we know this. We know the steel beams in the ceiling with brick arches. 
and we know that the windows are glued on the inside. And Leverens, you probably all know this, but Leverens was um, sacked from the um, Woodland Cemetery project and left and became a, a manufacturer and made windows and uh, metalwork, including, including all the metalwork for the um, Stockholm Metro, which is being extended into the suburbs. So he knew what he was doing. And this is a double glazed unit that's screwed to the wall and, and pointed with mastic. And it means that you see the view without any uh, frame of interrupting, without any intermediate experience. And this is what you get. Now, Klippan, and I've, I've got to put the data in this, Klippan is in the south of Sweden in Skuna. And this is really extraordinary because the floors move and the font is a, a shell and the baptismal water's in the floor. And Leverens did this in his later life. I think it was his last project. Well, it wasn't his last project. I'll tell you his last project in a minute, but um, so you get the font in the floor and then the column and beam that holds the roof up, of course, is a truncated cross. So here's a man that, that can press imagery out of construction like nobody else. Macintosh, another individualist. Macintosh, who, if you went to the School of Art before it burned down, everything, he couldn't leave anything alone. Every coat hook and bench and locker was designed in a most, in sometimes in a, a puzzling way, but always vivacious. But what I want to say about this building is it's about its composition. And so, you have a building which faces north with big studio windows, a facade which actually you could find in an industrial building if we go back. So what happens in the center is that there's a, another house, another facade superimposed with a little balcony and a porter's lodge and things like that. So it's a sort of odd and miraculous um, event, or it was until it burned down. And then it, of course, it, in each direction, it does something else. This is faces an escarpment. At the back on the right hand side, there's um, called the Henron, which was a connection between um, two parts of the building, which looked out over the city. And Gaudi, he must be the most inexplicable person ever, the Casa Mila, which I understand was when it, it was being designed as a speculative development for a, a lady client. And then it became apparent when Gaudi was presenting it to the client, that Gaudi, who was um, extremely pious and lived by be begging, that Gaudi's view was this was just a a small pedestal for a giant statue of the Virgin Mary. And the client said, I'm not having that. At which point Gaudi said, my assistants will do all this with this from now on. But what's interesting for me is how this facade uh, mimics the rocks. It's a, you know, it's a, well, it's called the quarry or it was called the quarry in, in the vernacular. But it's a, a way of making facades which um, isn't from primarily from the language of building, which is mostly where facades come from. And the balcony here is about seaweed. And on the other building, the um, Casa Batlo, the facade is, the balconies look like um, masks for a carnival. So he's, um, let's say his range of um, visual knowledge was very different from most architects. And this one really has to, be the cherry on the cake. It's um, Frank Gehry's Chiat Day building in Los Angeles. And I saw Gary talk about this and he said that they had made a model of the two sides, the copper one on the right and the white one on the left. And they were having a meeting with a client and there was an agreement that it needed 
some kind of element in the middle to make it have life. And on Gary's desk was a model of a pair of binoculars, which um, the artist Clayce Oldenburg had given him. And Oldenburg and Gary, I think, worked on a project for um, the Venice Biennale, which was a giant pair of binoculars. And Gary picked them up, he said, at random and put them in the model and everybody said yes it has to be that so they actually did make a set of binoculars um which as i understand it are habitable and i've looked very closely at this and i can't see how it's made i don't know what it's made of i was there and i still don't know what it's made it doesn't crack so it can't be plaster and it's not it's seamless so it can't be metal so it's um a real mystery this one classicism well, we think, could think of classicism as being simply a rule-bound um, procedure. And to some extent it is, although it's much more flexible than you imagine. And we found this out when I had, about two years ago in CAS, I set a program, part of which was for the students to design a pavilion using um, Palladio's books on architecture. And we had as a course tutor, Francis Terry, who, his father, Quinn and Terry, is a renowned classicist. And Francis was amazingly flexible in his way of doing things. He realized that, well, that's to dismiss the thought that classicism simply is boring. It's not. I mean, what Wren and Hawksmoor were concerned with were exactly the same issues as other people, which is space making, emphasis. And if you look, Along, if you walk along this colonnade in the middle, at a certain point, either side, behind the colonnade is a deep space. And this happens in Wren a lot, where you think of him, you think of Wren as a scientist, which he was by training. But he also knew about mystery. If you look at the um, dining room, in um, dining hall in um, Greenwich, uh, as you approach it up the staircase, you see the backs of the columns and they're undecorated. So you, it's revealed to be uh, an illusion in a sense. So Wren was a much more complicated character than we, we might think. And if we go a hundred years or nearly a hundred years ahead, we find from Adam's house in Chandos Street in the West End, which is a beautiful project making classicism with hardly anything. There are no columns on it. It's just a, it's domestic classicism, such as we found in Holland and England. A beautiful stone, a great door case, a band, and then a windowsill. You can't see that, but that windowsill is made of slate. So there's, he manages the figures in this facade to say exactly what he wants. Um, I was, this is about anonymous classicism, and it's Ascoli Picena in uh, Ascoli Picena. And this is a facade I particularly like, a facade that I can't even imagine how you would do it, but the richness of this, the kind of um, unembarrassed um, decoration and manipulation of surface is always fascinated me. And the square around it is also wonderful because it, of course, it's in different styles and that's what made these cities so wonderful. There was an underlying, you might say, vernacular classical, which drew them all together and allowed different scales of buildings to coexist while still making coherence. And that's something that we currently have lost, certainly in, in London for a number of reasons. And this is a slightly different thing. It was supposed to be about um, the propensity of facades to influence your behavior. That's the end of the lecture. That's the end of the lecture I didn't intend to give. And maybe I'll give the one that I intend to give when I can find it, which I lost this afternoon. So, if there are any questions, um, I'll take them.
Tony, that was sensational. I'm, I'm going to unmute everybody so we can hear 500 people clapping all around the world. Tony, could you perhaps um, uh, go back to the to, let's see you rather than the your screen perhaps? Stuck in this one, I can't get out of it. Um, you stuck? It's Buster Keaton. Buster Keaton. He it was a he plotted exactly where he would stand, and the house fell on him. It's the most wonderful image, I think. But I can't stop it. It's going to go on forever. <laughs> um, I need to. I need to. Uh, how do I get out of this? As you go to the top, I think. Uh, huh. Ah, God. Um, let me try something else. Can you press okay. the share screen button and then you'll, you should be to you. Yeah, okay, let me do that. Um, That's good. Was. Uh, you can see that the, the um, did you want to go to a specific image? Um, well, go, well I, I, let, if people have questions, why don't they let us know in the chat box on the right. Um, but maybe if I could just kick off with one, Tony, which is, sure. um, I, mean, I mean, what a fantastic talk. And you showed a huge sort of, you know, range of, of, of different responses to this issue. Um, maybe, could I bring, a, could I bring back uh, um, a link to your work or a question about your work, what you take from the, this kind of range of material? I mean, one of the things that strikes me about your work, whenever you make the cards, is, but there is a high level of abstraction at play, particularly, I think you, you shun um, making elevations where construction is very expressive in the way that it might have been for a or, uh, or Gaudi or even you know, some of your contemporaries. There's always a sort of interest in, um, in sort of, yeah, I, I think abstraction is the word. Could, could you kind of um, talk a little about what, what, why that impulse sort of informs your work? Can I turn the light on? I can barely see myself. I'm sure, it'd be us. Awesome. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we're looking at your screen, I, I, Tony. We're not, not looking at you. I'm sorry? We're looking at your screen. We're not looking at you. Oh, well, that's interesting. So uh, the answer to that question is I've chosen not to discuss my facades. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I don't, okay, let me try to find an answer. So for example, the, if we start from the latest project, which would be um, West Kai, you know, the towers in, in Antwerp. Yeah, which people may know. Um, we were compelled to make them of brick, and they were in a range of um, buildings by um, Dina and Chipperfield. And yet, we were, who'd got much more um, sophisticated materials available to them. And we, so we had to do something that was more demonstrative. So we chose, well, we were compelled to use brick. And um, I wanted, for some reason lately, I've been um, experimenting with um, single gestures. You know, Listen Gallery is complex. It's got lots of things going on in it. And as the office gets more mature, it's difficult to do that, especially if you're working for developers. You know, if you want to make a living, which you have to as a practice, you have to think about how you're going to produce um, buildings much more quickly. So I thought, that we would have a single image for this, and it would be an image that I hope would be persuasive, which it seems to be. People like it. And it's funny. I mean, it's, it's two buildings, one which is, has a horizontal emphasis and one which has a vertical emphasis through the bricks projecting. And Paul Vermeulen says when he sees it, it makes him laugh. 
which I think is interesting. You know, how do you make a identity for Burnings, which is slightly outside uh, the center of Antwerp in a, dock, a Docklands area, where you make something which, where people know it. People say, you live in that building with the bricks? And you say, yeah, I do. The other thing was that the corners, we made the corners um, open for two reasons. One was that if you're in the Docklands, you, a broad view is all you have. You don't, it's not like looking across the street. You have a panoptic view. But it also gave um, dynamics to the facades when you look at them. And um, David Chipperfield was compelled to remove corner balconies. And I think his building would have been better if it had not happened. Um, so that's that's what's happening now with the Red House, which is a long time ago now. Every, everything I've done is a long time ago. The Red House um, was at a point where I, um, instead of making architecture, which came from events and uh, material, as I'll explain about the Listen Gallery in a minute, I wanted to make a building which was about architecture and spe specifically about all the architecture that I'd loved when, I, when looking at Palazzi in Italy or um, um, Dutch canal houses. I wanted to make a building which was as um, impressive as any European modernist building, which is you know, immodest, but that's what I wanted to do. I was also, and have been for a long time, fascinated by the asymmetries that you find in um, Victorian, um, uh, let's say, aesthetic movement buildings, where you get a large window um, next to a, um, a series of small windows. Um, and I wanted to use a material, red stone, which was different from the materials of the street, but which had a tonal connection. And I learned something a long time ago. I, I was told about a, a friend of mine was showing me a painting by Matisse, which has, um, on the one side, it has a, a bowl of goldfish, and the other it has a fig plant. And that it was explained to me that the shape of the goldfish and the shape of the leaf on the fig were the same. So differences were bound together in an underlying way. They were composed together. So I understood how you can do that with a bit of courage. You can. First of all, set simple rules like alignments and things like that. And then from that, you, just, you develop something radical. Um, Ellis, she um, was that. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, we're getting a few questions in. Um, I'm, I've got someone called Matt's iPhone. I'm not altogether sure who that is, but. Can I, can I, turn, can I stop sharing the screen and just answer the questions? Yeah, go for it, yeah. yeah. All right, let me see if I can do that. I'm answering a question. I rolled. Matt, are okay. you there? Can you see me? Yeah, perfect. Okay, Matt. I can read it if you can't. If you're not there. Uh, the, okay. The question is: You once said that Khan was more talented than Le Corbusier, who made the better facades. Um, Corbusier was a phenomenal facade maker, and you'll always get something. I always get something from looking at him. Um, I think uh, Khan was different. I mean, Corbusier was the most fertile mind. I don't like everything he did. And some of the buildings, like his apartment, are really unpleasant, I think. But in the main, you, you can't overrate him as a facade maker. There's always something to learn from him. From Khan, there's something else. You know, the building that I perhaps should have shown was the... Um, Mellon Center in um, New Haven for British art, which does this extraordinary thing with abstract forms. It simulates or implies a, an English baronial interior. Or, I don't know how he does it, but there's such a force of intent in, in Khan that somehow he communicates something with the most obscure means. And that's that's a kind of intensity of um, belief that 
Corbusier had, but Corbusier had it in another way. Does that answer your question? Matt's not playing ball. Um, <laughs> but, um, we, this is the answer. Oh, God. Uh, Tony just might have gone away. Um, Tony, we are at the end of our allotted hour. But um, thank you so much. It was a sensational uh, kind of tour. And um, uh, I'm, I'm getting one more. Qu oh, now the questions are coming in. Yeah. Uh, can you see the questions? I've got time. I've got time. I'm not time okay, pressed. Well, let's get, we've got a couple of questions, so let's pitch them in. Um, um, I'm going to read them just for, 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 I think, a bit easier. So I've got from Reese Oliver. Uh, do you find that showing a final image at such an early stage of projects, now when entering for competitions, retracts from architectural exploration processes involved when developing building form? Well, I'm sorry, say it again. I don't quite understand it. Um, he's asking if, if the, the necessity of uh, making a final image in a competition proposal yeah. uh, is um, you know, problematic in terms of the way you might very, very problematic. building form. Extremely problematic, but you know, if you with a client, you can where you have some sense of security with the project, you can elicit from them what they like and what they don't like and what their needs are over a long period of time or longer period of time. But with a competition, you have to try to intuit what a client would want. That's extremely difficult. And you have to produce imagery. And it, depending on a competition, a lot of competitions now are governed by imagery. You know, the v &A courtyard building was one on imagery rather than usefulness, I think. And it is problematic, but in a way, that's where some types of projects come. You won't get them any other way in competition. So we do very limited amounts of competitions. We only do them if there's a sensible honorarium. We don't make too much loss. We do them if, if the project looks sensibly set up and there's good judging. But beyond that, you, your chances of winning a competition are tiny in a way. And there are lots and lots of competition wins that I've done, which have probably been better than buildings that we've built. So it is a very problematic way of um, procuring buildings. Um, I've got, I can see um, Francesca Torzo, a very great architect, who's been in our program and quite recently. Uh, Hi, Francesca. Is, um, asking a question. Francesca, can you hear us? Mm, so there. Yes, yeah. but I am shy. Uh, no, we can hear you, Francesca. You can hear me. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I can so hear you. I, 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 so as you hear, I speak while I type. Uh, <laughs> so I am, um, um, what I wrote, and I'm sorry that it went out before I finished. Uh, but I was really struck by uh, this flow of uh, observations and thoughts uh, with such empathy and nudity. In a way, what you saw and lived uh, in all these buildings uh, is very alive and speaks of uh, so many times uh, back and forth uh, and about life. And uh, so I first, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very thankful for this gift. Thank you. The question is, uh, why do you think uh, this ability of uh, uh, seeing, listening to plurality, the nonchalance uh, and grace uh, in many different ways, as you, saw, as you showed, uh, there is not one way, there is not one uh, character, one language, Fortunately, I believe, uh, but uh, this uh, reduction or this uh, cr um, uh, this difficulty in uh, nourishing uh, and uh, cultivating uh, the plurality. Yes. Yeah. Why? I'm, as a teacher, I 
want, I hope, to allow each student to find their own voice. And um, I think the world's better if there are different points of view, but with a sense of the uh, community of architecture. So people can have differences but not be doctrinal, I think. And one of the big disappointments of the last 30 years has been the way that um, star architecture has occurred, where it puts the star under enormous pressure to endlessly produce cutting edge work instead of making buildings which have longevity, you know, where people would enjoy them for a long time. So, um, I think you can overcome that if you have a society which in, isn't in the sway of great names, but is um, much more um, aware of um, architecture as a whole. I've just written an article for Domus, which may or may not be published, which writes about three relatively unknown architects. And I consciously chose small projects by each of them just to check, just to test um, Damas's resolve in, in really looking at issues. And the key statement in that uh, article is that, that amongst all the architects that exist, um, the ones that live on thin air by teaching are the most dignified because they do most interesting work and it's not interesting perhaps in the terms of consumable architecture but it's interesting at a social level and I think it's time for those kinds of architects to be recognized. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah sorry I, I show my face maybe it's unpolite. It's me. <laughs> hey. <I'm so laughs> Yes. I go away again because I'm a little shy. Don't worry, it's nice to see you. Really, thank you. Um, and the last one I think we're going to be able to fit in tonight uh, is uh, from Christoph Grafer, who I've just unmuted. Christoph. My former colleague at TU Delft. It will be a complex and difficult question. Christoph, what do you want to ask? Thank you very much to start with. Uh, well, it, 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 I can reread read the tress, question, of course, as I wrote it. Uh, does one have to ignore the precise historical circumstances of one's references, your references, mm -hmm. which would be uh, dehistoricizing them, to understand, really understand, what they may mean for the present? Absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly why you do it. And I, in the studios, I always try to get students not to use the word precedent because it implies a kind of slavishness. And what I'm interested in is for architects to absorb architecture from any period, which they think has um, communicative relevance for the present time. Mm. And there's one of the big um, negatives of modernism, and let's say it's, it's um, focus currently in the work of people like Herzog and Dimmerer, is this need to not be recognizably um, connected to any previous architecture. And that's a huge mistake from my point of view. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they sleep at night. Um, I mean, I think architecture has a past and, I, and the analogy I make when I talk about the Red House is that um, if we, the modernist architecture as we now see it, its obsession with originality, which came, let's say, from modernism's desire that all problems should be solved anew, was only one aspect of modernism. And if you look at painting, music, and literature, um, those other arts or creative practices had a very free relationship with the past. So Stravinsky would write um, the rites of spring using, in his time, the developments of French music, but he would use uh, a, a motif from um, uh, the Russian tradition. And James Joyce structured the book Ulysses on the myth of Ulysses and then used it as a way of, of using vernacular speech. And 
Picasso, we know, always saw um, uh, Cubism as a, a continuation of the tradition and repainted Velasquez. So it seems to me that it's completely legitimate to use any architecture from any period of time, provided it, it talks about the present time. If you don't do that, then you're doing something else. You're doing a, a sort of classical architecture or a traditionalist architecture, which does not explore, well, it's a difficult subject. I mean, some people, classical architecture today does satisfy a current need, but let's say in terms of being progressive and understanding the world more fully, we have to live in the present time. Tony, thank you so much. Um, we should wrap it up, not least because I'm being summoned to dinner uh, downstairs. Uh, but um, we have, um, uh, to later tonight, Maria Smith is over on Instagram live reading some Will Self. And tomorrow we, in this slot, we have uh, Richard Sennett uh, contributing. Now, um, this, we, we, we've kind of pretty much scheduled up this program for the first four or five weeks. But we're really keen that, um, to, to have kind of proposals for further contributions. We're running till August the 27th. Um, and I know that there's lots of people in the audience tonight who, um, who would be more than capable of coming up with something fascinating. So please uh, pitch us some proposals. Um, my email is ellis at architecturefoundation.org.uk. Um, I'm going to do a bit of unmuting again so we can have some more applause. And then um, yeah, we're asking every speaker to choose uh, their own uh, theme tune. And uh, so you were hearing Miles Davis's So What on the way in, and we might have that on the way out too. Um, I hope to see you soon, guys. Thank you.